Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much indeed, as always, for being here. It's a day early. Yes, I know we usually do it on a Friday, but it's an interlull. There's not much going on. So why not get something out for people to listen to? Is it a day early? Listen, time is just a construct. There's no law that says the podcast has to come out one day or the other, is there? There is not. So we're not breaking the law, and you're not breaking the law by listening to this. A bit later on, because obviously there's a bit of Ben White chat in this uh, particular episode, because, well, Ben White is not out of the news for half a second at this moment in time, so we will talk about him. But if you stick with us, you will have a chance towards the end of the show to win something quite exclusive indeed. I will explain in more detail towards the end of the show, but we should just get on and have the conversation that we're going to have in this particular podcast. And as ever, it's my pleasure to welcome back, you'll know him from the Arsenal Vision podcast, it's Clive Palmer. Hi, Clive. Hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm sort of coasting through this interlull uh, on a sort of sea of tranquility, if you like, Arsenal are top of the table. We'll come to that because maybe it won't be as tranquil uh, in a few weeks' time. But for the moment, we can enjoy uh, being where we are. I want to start with you know, the big story of this week, I suppose, is the new contract for Takahiro Tomiyasu, uh, a yeah. really excellent player. And I suppose there are two things at play here. People will say, yes, he is a, a fantastic player, a guy who can play across the back line, right back, left back, either center half position. Like I would challenge anybody to go out right now, even you, even Elliot, scout me a player who can play in all of those positions to the standard that he can play in them. So I think it's it's really understandable why Arsenal have decided to give him a new deal and, and hold on to him for another few seasons. At the same time, though, I think you always have to acknowledge that there are some issues with uh, reliability, availability, injuries yeah. when, when it comes to, to Tommy. Um your thoughts on the contract and and maybe on the way that this contract has been structured in that Arsenal have given him two years plus one. It's not like a blanket four year deal with an option that, that they're obviously confident that he can overcome these injury issues, but at the same time, they've, they've been mindful of the history, if you like. Yeah. I think also, Andrew, we brought a number of young players at a similar time and some of the, um, some of the transfer fees were a bit heavy, like Ben White, for example, felt a bit heavy at the time, but the wages weren't heavy. Mm. Right? So our wage bill really came down. And Tommy Yasu, you know, his wage bill, his original wage wasn't that heavy. 16 million quid or 16, 17 million quid transfer fee. Mm. And we, none of us knew much about him, shall we say, although we, we started to look at him once we were linked. And he's coming and we now know the player. And we now know he's... He's one of us, right? And his versatility is unbelievable. If you try and, you know, as you said, you can't find that. Spurs just brought Dragosin in in January, 20-odd mil, played his first game, really came play centre-back. That's what you're comparing to, that type of level of player. And we already know what Tomiyasu can do in, in three positions. So it does make sense um, that he's... it would be interesting to know what the discussion was when he signed, what your role is going to be. Mm. You know, because it looks like, you know, in basketball, you have star players and role players. And it looks like he's a role player. And the way football is going, we're going to need more Tommy Asus that can do three or four things to a high standard. And if they do really, really well, they're going to play. Mm. And then someone else got to take them out. So he's going to provide massive competition across the back line. But a real high level of quality when someone no doubt gets an injury, we got that backfield. Yeah, I, th- I think your point about wages is, is quite interesting too because over the last 18 months, Arsenal have secured pretty much every top player and even some non-top players, if you like, to new contracts and new deals. And with a new deal comes a new salary usually, right? So it might be a signing on fee paid across the duration of the contract, which boosts your nominal weekly wage or whatever it might be. But as everybody increases, as Saka increases, Odegaard increases, Saliba increases, you also have to be mindful of the disparity between these star players and the guys who are in there doing it every single week. And I don't think for a second Tommy Asu would be saying, well, I 
demand and deserve the same wage as someone like Saka or Odegaard. I don't think that's yeah. the case by any means. But when you bring a guy in for 15, 16 million and the wage is probably pretty low because he's coming from Serie A, so you can give him yeah. a nice healthy boost in wages. Um, but it's it's sort of uh, uh, not a pittance, but it is relatively small in Premier League terms. Yeah. But as those disparities grow within the squad, you have to manage that because otherwise you create a sort of disharmony if the gulf between someone like Tommy Asu and someone like Odegaard or Saka becomes too big. Yeah, you have to manage that proactively, Andrew. And I think... You know, we'll so just tell me how to sign because we're natural worriers, right? So we worry. There isn't much to worry about because everybody's signed up till <laughs> that 2035, wherever it is. So there isn't much to worry about. But you know the person I look at and think, you know what, mate? You need to have a knock on the mahogany door. And that's probably Big Gabby because he was one of the first ones to mm. resign. And he may have resigned. I'm. I'm I'm guessing here, Andrew, we're just intelligent guessing. He may have re-signed at a level which he, for me, he has now surpassed. So would that be smart, proactive management to get him back to sit down? Maybe so. I Maybe mean, there? yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, the the absence of, of Gabriel from the first few games of the season, you know, <sighs> explained away as tactical made no sense to me and no sense to most people and it might well have been a case that I think Gabriel even admitted it didn't he recently where he talked about Saudi Arabia and Arteta had sort of not convinced him to stay but there was something going on there so it might well be a case that when you compare and contrast his salary with Saliba with Odegaard with Saka that that maybe he went a little bit too early he was happy obviously to commit to new terms, but but it might be a case that we have to just sort of acknowledge his consistency and importance. Yeah, I think his influence has grown, hasn't it? I yeah. mean, the start of the season, we were trying to you know Thomas Party thing, and we we're trying to convince ourselves, us tactical wizards, that that was working. <laughs> but mate, when we, as soon as we could see the goal, Gabriel was whipped off the off the bench, wasn't he? And uh, so there's a story there to be untold, right? And so let's be honest. With him and Saliba, they have helped take us to a new place, right? We can do things tactically that we can't do with almost anybody else. Yeah. We can pretend we can do it, but we can't do it as well. And Gabriel's influence and authority within the team and his role within the team have become really clear. The complementary skill sets between him and Saliba and the defenders around him, his aggressive role, he's, you know, he's almost like he's the enforcer in our team. You know, and then given our improvement on set pieces, I mean, who's behind a lot of that? Mm. You know, when he when he gets in the box, he turns into Bob Latchford. I'll just throw a name out there for everybody else a bit yeah, older. Yeah, that, that'll <laughs> really connect with our younger listeners, Clive. Well done. <laughs> he, he turn, okay, let's go. Let's, let's go a little bit younger. He turns into Slatan. How's that, right? So, um, so and and he he does around the box. So, um, so yeah, I think um, everybody's now come not say come around to him because there was a few rumours, wasn't there that maybe we could technically upgrade all the rest of it. Looking mm. first world problems, mate, to be honest. But to me now, he's he's critical and fast becoming almost like a cult figure. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say there are shades of Koscielny, but when Koscielny arrived first, there were some doubts over him and he developed over time into a really, really good central defender. And when we think about how old Gabriel is now, is he 25, 26 I mean, that is peak, you know, coming into your peak age, um, I'm just Googling here and it's trying to give me uh, Gabriel Byrne as my first, yeah, he's 26. So he's, you know, he's right in the peak years or heading into the peak years of a, of a central defender. So, you know, you, you have to learn along the way as a defender. And once you get to this age, it, it's when it really starts to, um, starts to come together with, with consistency and, and everything else. But ju But just going back to contracts, I think Arsenal and Edu and Richard Garlick and the team deserve a lot of credit for yeah. for securing the future of all of the players that we want to hold on to and maybe even some of the players that we don't want to hold on to at this moment in time, but who, if we manage to find a buyer for them, could prove to be a, a little bit lucrative you know, because we gave them a new deal and hung on to them rather than let, uh, let them go for free. You know, there are a couple of players that, that spring to mind, like Eddie, Reese Nelson who may or may not go this summer, but, you know, could easily have left the club for free. So we'll see how that, that pans out. But how much easier has it been for them? 
because of the progression and the development of this yeah. team that that there is a sort of snowball effect and we've seen it it was Gabriel Martinelli I think who was maybe the first to sign on and then it was Gabriel and then it was uh, Martin or, or Bakayo Sa- you know these things so once those guys start uh, putting pen to paper everyone else goes well fuck you know, I'm not going to be the guy who's uh, jumping ship here. If these guys feel like this is the place to be, then this is the place to be for me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, these players, they have they have these agents and representatives, right? And they, they're around them and they look around the club and look how the club is operating. They have relationships with the key executives in the club and they know the future and they know before they're going to commit. They say it's their job to find out for their player What's happening at this club? Where are we going? Is the support consistent? Is it going to continue? Are the executives and leadership and and the vice chair, etc., behind the manager? Is there a level of stability here? You ask all these questions before you commit your player to a contract. And that, in some way, this is a real indicator of, of how we're operating and the connectivity within the club. I think it's very important at all levels. And it's almost like a, we we look at the football. If it's going well, we're happy. We have a look around at the extraneous stuff, but we really look at the football. But this, the way we operate, and looking around at other clubs at the moment that are trying to regenerate their organisational structure, Man United, for example, Newcastle, for example, mm. Liverpool, for example, we have that stability in place. So it does make the signing things in plural easier to uh, commit to. Is the next step? What I just mentioned, that part of the strategy of of getting these guys to sign new contracts is to, uh, you know, strengthen your team, provide stability, provide a platform for you to develop and grow and continue to to improve, but also that it, it has to be this sort of ongoing process. You can't just sign players to new contracts over and over without selling some of them along the way. This is a conversation that's been had plenty of times. Like, is this the summer where Edu really needs needs to show that, you know, he can do the other side of this? Is this the summer where Edu really needs to show he can do the other side of this? Yeah, I think in our minds for the project, air quotes, this is the summer to sell the players who are not quite there at the moment. And maybe the team has developed past. But I've got one little nagging worry, Andrew. One little nagging worry. In January, showed us something, and I know it's a new financial period, but this, these PSR rules, we may have to think differently about how we sell and how we buy because there is a lot of pressure around a number of teams in their financial situation, and we are making these assumptions that these teams could just afford the 20s and 30 millions and mm. round rounds are even more, for example. Um, we're just making that assumption. And they may not be able to. And I think this is going to be a real challenge. And I, I think it's going to be a real challenge also from a, a buying perspective. Not really a challenge, maybe an opportunity. So as we sit here today, and I'm YouTube and all these players from the Portuguese league and from the <laughs> German league, you know what I'm like, right? <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, yeah, he'll do, he'll do, he'll do. I think to myself, I woke up this morning, I thought, well, actually, why should I take that risk early? Why should I take a risk on somebody outside of the league that I'm not sure can adapt to the league? Why don't I sit tight and see what's happening at Newcastle? See what's happening at Everton? See what's happening at Chelsea with some of their younger talents and see if they're able to keep them. Mm. See if we are able to leverage our strong financial position to maybe take an opportunity and reduce our risk profile because we know said player has actually done it in the league. Yeah. And I think, it's, so I'm going to have to hold my YouTube, mate, for a bit, hold my dreams and hold my five signing list and wait for this to unfold because I think it's going to be a unique year, fiscally, given what's happening with the the regulator hanging around the game potential of an independent regulator, for example. Mm. We're going into unknown territory, Andrew, for my a financial point of view, a regulation point of view, what's happening with the government. There's a, this is the period where I'm just trying to hold my normal, exciting transfer window thoughts. Yeah. I, I, it is interesting because I do think the Premier League has become its own thing, its own market, mm-hmm. because of 
because of wages, because of player valuations. Like it's it's really difficult to sell a player for big money outside of of the Premier League. Inside yeah. the Premier League, you know, if Everton and Nottingham Forest, and we might come back to this a little bit later on, you know, if those are two clubs who have by virtue of timing more than anything, let's say with Nottingham Forest, who I think made a really good point about the PSR rules um, tying in with June 30th contract expirations when actually the end of the market, when so much business gets done towards the end of the market, might be a much better time to, to look at where you are or how your books are balanced. But if those clubs are skating close to the wind and have gone and breached those rules, there must be others as well. And perhaps within the Premier League, there are those uh, opportunities and, and potentials. But like I said, we might come back to that because I do think it's it's quite interesting. The other big story of, of the week, and it's ongoing, and it seems to be rumbling on and on and on and on, is Ben White and England. And I know you've spoken quite a bit about this on, on the Arsenal Vision podcast, but I, I do want to chat to you about it. I suppose, you know, there is this, um, there's an element of timing to this, right? In that it's, it can only have happened in the interlull because the international games are coming up and Ben White has uh, chosen not to be available for England. So it's in the spotlight because of these games, but because there's nothing else going on, it's yeah. just sort of, there's nothing to take its place. You know, that story about, you know, the old uh, adage about, well, today's news is yesterday's chip paper. It's the same fucking chip paper over and over and over with this. Um, it just strikes me that that so much of what you see about this kind of misses the point of what's going on. All this stuff about how Ben White is a disgrace and he's letting his country down. You don't have to spend more than 30 seconds Googling Ben White in England to find video footage of him talking about how excited he was and how honored he was to be chosen for England in the first place. The issue now clearly isn't with England, but with this current England setup. Not yeah. England as a team, as a country, but with individuals or an individual within this current England setup. And that it just strikes me as amazing that, that so much focus is on sort of his refusal rather than looking at what's actually happened and what's been reported this week tells us exactly what's happened. Yeah, so it started off with um, a nicely choreographed Southgate press conference where the Sky reporter asked him a lovely little a little dolly question and he was ready with the answer. And as soon as I saw that answer, I thought, mate, that's that's not correct. <laughs> because, and there are people out there, Andrew, shall we say, in the journalist world that know the story. They know it very accurately. It was, it was reported up to a point in the athletic case reported in the Daily Telegraph by Sam Wallace yesterday. And that feels fairly accurate based on the little knowledge that I have, right? Particularly the Sam Wallace, right down to the conversation and how this happened. And I think from a, there's a couple of angles here. There is a Southgate angle and how he's managed this situation. I think he may have misread it. I think he felt that the player may not have been as important as he as he could be. He didn't project forward. And the competition in the right-back space is, is, is getting smaller and smaller. And now you see a player that's tactically top level, playing for the top team in the country, that can do many different roles. And is the partner to the England Supporters Player of the Year, two years on the trot, Bukaya Saka. Mm. Maybe you maybe you've cut off your nose to spite your face, really, by not trying to invest in that player coach relationship and allowing this to develop. You can choose as a coach who you pick. I have no problems with that. None whatsoever. If you don't fancy that player, that's your prerogative. It's your show. You do what you like. But how you manage that Arsenal asset for me is important as an Arsenal man. And I don't think you can expose that player to the wider world. And what's happened really with what Arsenal have done, with various articles have done, is put the side of the story, which is at odds with what our Southgate originally told people. And for me, this is a, a failure of leadership and a failure of accountability. 
we've heard Mikhail say words like, when things go wrong, just hit me in the chest. Mm. Hit me in the chest, you know? And I feel sometimes as a coach, you've got to throw yourself on, on the fire a little bit and just back this away. And there, there will always be another day for this to be readdressed. For me, it's all about leadership, accountability, and maybe just a player that doesn't quite fit that environment. And you either manage that situation or you push it to one side. You don't expose the player to the um, flag wearing public um, who are waving those flags in some quarters, Harry Redknapp, for example, and really creating division. And I don't like to see that around our players. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And I think we, we sort of overlook the fact that we live in a world where I'm not going to say people are more individualistic, but people are more prepared to be an individual rather than just sort of go along. Okay. I've been called up for England. I'll go. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to enjoy it. You know? And again, it comes back, I think to the a very specific set of circumstances when it, when it comes to Ben White, but he's been put very much in the firing line. As you say, I heard things, you heard things. Yeah pretty much completely aligned with what's come out this week. So it's inconceivable to me that, you know, high profile journalists who last week wrote things about Ben White and about how he would, for example, always be known as the guy who turned down, regardless of what he does in his career, Arsenal can win five Champions Leagues in a row, and apparently Ben White will only be known as the guy who wouldn't play for England, despite the fact that those people must have known what we were aware of and what people have been talking about you know, behind the scenes for, for quite a long time. It, it feels unfair on him. And I don't worry too much about Ben White. I don't worry about his ability to to deal with this or compartmentalize it. But at the same time, when you are in the spotlight and when it feels as relentless as it does, as I'm sure it does for him, and I think he'll be well protected at Arsenal and, and all the rest. I've got no yeah. no worries about it. But, you know, it is it is still something to deal with when you are a relatively young man. You get to our age, you don't give a fuck what anyone says about anything, right? <laughs> but when you're a young man, I suppose, you know, you you you, you might be more inclined to, to take things to heart. Whether Ben White is one of those guys or not, I'm not sure. I think he can go home, close the door, and fucking not worry about it. But it has felt a bit targeted. Yeah, it has. And without recognising the pressures that these young men are under today, and, and Andrew, what we're talking about here we we talk about how he chooses to live his life with with the word work life balance and he has to we're talking about how he spends his spare time we're not talking about him as a professional mm. we're not talking about his ability to take on tactical messages because we've seen him change positions this season we've seen him play in multiple positions i know louis wrote a great article about it and Tactically, we can all, we know what we're seeing. We've been watching him for a couple of years. We know what's happened, how he's changed his body, how he's changed his, his repeat sprint ability. He's, he has transformed more than almost any other player. And tactically, he makes us able to change our shape so many different ways. And he's the player that moves to allow us to do that. He could be tactically the most important player in our team. You know, and he does that. And then someone's questioning, he's almost questioning his professionalism. You know, and for me, you can't do that. You can't do that. That is not leadership. That is not management. That is not what you do. When you're a coach, you're trying to develop an environment where people can flourish, not chop their legs off because they can't answer a question. Mm. You know, and in front of the in front of the whole squad. Very poor. And it's quite interesting the the articles that have come out this week, and I totally agree with your point. If Clive and Andrew know what's gone on everyone knows what's going on, that get paid to do this as their job, right? So, and so let's be genuine here. This, we're, we're finding out who's genuine, aren't we? Mm. We're finding out who's genuine with the articles that they've written. And so you can, you can, you can take your place, you can take your choice. For me, I'm, I'm calmer now, Andrew. When it first kicked off, I thought, oh no, that's wrong. And I really sort of exploded. Now I'm with, with you. I also put their arms around him. But they did when Kai Havertz was going through a tough time. They put their arms around him and asked for support. Ben White will get the same support, get the same support from the club and the same support from his fans. And as Arsenal people, that's all that's important to me, that he's not damaged as an Arsenal asset going forward. Yeah. 
and I think as well the you know times have changed and the I'm not going to say the importance because there are people who are very invested in their national teams and that's brilliant mm-hmm. and people who are invested in their country doing well I think there are cultural uh, differences you know depending on where you are in the world how um, behind your national team you might be like we know for example Brazil be all and end all win the World Cup you know that's what it is yeah. I think it's a little bit different in Europe perhaps Um Again, depending on you know, where you come from, it might be a little bit easier to just say, oh, I don't give a shit about international football because, you know, we're not going to do anything in these tournaments anyway. Uh, but the the way that the club game and the profile of the club game and the, the quality of the club game, and this is the key point, there was a time where playing for your country was absolutely the pinnacle of football. It was the highest quality you could get that was what people aspired to. I think now the balance is the other way. It is the club teams that are the best teams in the world in which the best players want to succeed, perhaps some of them more than they do for their national teams. Yeah, I think we talk about the levels of the game, right? So we're in our minds now, we all think about Bayern Munich. (laughs) We're petrified. (laughs) And and that game is going to be a top-level game. No one can convince me that the international game is at that level. It, it just isn't. In the main, there are obviously clashes in late in tournaments where you're seeing the best of the best versus each other. It's quite interesting to see the the chat around Southgate at the moment potentially going to Manchester United. <laughs> if the international game was so high, well, why don't you want the Manchester the England manager Manchester United people? I mean, why not take him? I mean, this is the top level of the game, Andrew. Why are they worried about it? They should just take him and can't wait for him to get there. So we, we hold this game up to a high level, mm. but really we know, really we know, most of the friendlies are not important to us. And when it gets to a summer tournament, it's all about, okay, how can we make, this is a nice drink time. Let's, let's all get together and have what's the tournament. And it's, and it's, it's excellent. It's pretty, it's absolutely brilliant. The atmosphere it creates in countries. Oh, fantastic. Let's celebrate that. Let's get together and celebrate it. And when it's done, it's done. When does preseason start? Yeah. <laughs> you know, literally that is it. When can I buy a player? And that's, and that's what, that's how we live, right? So, um, let's not pretend. And I think Southgate was pulling the old hierarchical thing. And really throwing him out there and say he should be more without saying it, he should be proud to have this. But he's just not available to me. I've tried my best, mate. You trust me. You're not. You're not fooling me. You're not yeah. fooling anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Southgate to United stuff is very funny. I mean, it's clearly just absolute bollocks. There's no way. There's just no way that that could fucking happen. Um, can I throw? Can I throw you a theory? Can go on. Yeah, please. I'm gonna throw you a theory because it's something I have predicted actually. It's, but it wasn't for Southgate, for somebody else. I did hear a long time ago, just from reading things around Manchester United world, that if Sir Jim came in, he wanted to go a little bit more English and British. Right. Right. So, and so the Dan Ashworth thing, I could see that one coming. Right. So, mm. and so they're looking to build a bit more of a British centric identity. And think about it a little more deeply. What Man City have done, very global, 12, 13 global clubs around the world, got the best major, etc. All the best players and all the biggest wages, we know what they're doing. How does Manchester United create an identity? How do they make themselves almost like the Dallas Cowboys, America's team? You create an identity by being maybe England's team. By getting the England manager or a manager that's English, that has a, a an insight into the England camp. So you're, you're going to see players, I'm, I love this stuff, you're going to see players like Conor Gallagher suddenly thinking about Manchester United and things like that. It could be a direction they go down. Mm. And so I don't dismiss it. I, you know, if it's Southgate or Graham Potter, for example, I don't dismiss it because it could fit the model they're trying to go for. Mm. You know, so yeah, I mean that that does make some sense. It just would really, really surprise me if if it was Southgate. You know, because <laughs> I mean, objectively, objectively, you know, I'm an Irishman here. Objectively, he has done a he's done stuff with England that very few other managers have ever done. I like got yeah. them to the final, got them to semi finals. You know, the, there's a consistency about England now in in tournaments, but at the same time, it's sort of 
weirdly unconvincing. Like you're never convinced that England are going to be able to do, but they have this uh, amazing generation of, of talent now. You know, I personally, if it's not Ten Hag, I quite happily see Gareth Southgate at, at Manchester United <laughs> for a number of years to come. You know, no two ways about it. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to be fair to Southgate, he's done a lot with England. He was involved with the whole St. George's Park thing. He was involved with the E Triple P for the young elite player performance program, mm. which defined the academies and how they will coach players. And so he's been a big part of the FA for a long time. Just help give us some of these players. So I am not a ultra critic of Southgate because I can see the good he's done for the England dressing room, for the diversity in England coaching. He's created the England team that everyone can love. There was a time when I was growing up, you couldn't support England. No chance, right? And so, but now you can openly. And so I'm not someone's anti, anti Southgate because he upset one of our players. But I think in this case, he's done it wrong. He's managed it inappropriately. Mm. And, um, and I will say, and I will say so for my opinion, but, but yeah. Rock on to Manchester United, mate. I'm happy for you to go there. <laughs> <laughs> He's done amazing work for Jordan Henderson. Fair play to Gareth Southgate. All right, let's <laughs> let's park that. Let's park that. I, I want to talk about the title race and about how you're feeling about it and about how we as fans are going to experience it over the next 10 games. And... We know that there are all these narratives in play. It's 20 years since the Invincibles. It's 20 years since Arsenal last won the Premier League. Could we do it? Are the stars aligned? We'll have to wait and see. But I'm I'm curious as to, you know, 20 years ago, we were younger men. Yeah. And the media landscape was very, very different. And... I think the whole the, the whole experience of of football is different these days because you know look uh, 20 years ago weirdly I was writing about Arsenal every day on Ars blog but you know not to the same extent that yeah. that um we do now because of the way the media landscape is because of how people consume media what you have to what you have to provide people in in terms of content and all of those things it felt to me like there was much more of a sort of gap between games and now you of course you experience those gaps between games but do you ever properly switch off can you stop thinking about it you know you always have to have an idea or an opinion or or something that's going on it it feels all encompassing and that's just part of you know the way it works these days i'm curious as to you know can you remember back then can you throw your mind back that far and think about how it was when you know we were involved in a really really uh, titanic battle with with Manchester United for uh, season after season after season. Even um, I was looking today, I, I'd completely forgotten that Liverpool finished second in the season that we went to Old Trafford and won the league. So there was a sort of three way thing going on there. But you know these battles with Manchester United, I can remember sitting watching those games and, and literally my legs shaking because I was so nervous. Um, <laughs> It is different now, maybe more able to control the nerves, but less able to sort of escape the the bubble that is the Premier League in this title race. Yeah, back then it felt more sort of simple. It's just like it was a game. Mm. Was your team good enough to beat their team? You know, <laughs> we moaned about referees. We moaned about Fergie and his influence in the game, his oversized <laughs> influence, shall we say? And we were <laughs> we were after Mike Riley in our minds and things like this. That's that's where it stopped. Literally, it was that. That's where it stopped. Now, oh my God, we can see graphs of of our running and the strength of the teams comparing to the strength of the opposition's teams. We can see everything. We can see all the data around this, and we're exposed to so much more information that it is, it is, it, it takes us over, right? It takes us over. So if I'm looking at this from a fan perspective, I'm thinking, this is new, Andrew. Yeah. This is new for me and you. We're doing this for the first time in this, in this world, in this new modern world. And how it's going to affect us as fans and how it's going to, we think we know, but we don't know. We, we really don't. And it's how it's going to affect us as fans. It's new for us. It's new for the players. 
It's new for the coaches. It's brand new. So how would how do you approach this? Do you look at the 10 games or so you're going to have coming up? For me, I would go the opposite way. I would literally, when you've got a big task ahead of you, the first thing you do is you chunk it up into small chunks mm. because then you can absorb it. If you look at the whole thing, it can overcome you. But if you take it, for me, I'm literally, if I'm the coaches, I'm looking at 15-minute slots, mate. I want to manage our games much better. We have a huge, hugely compressed schedule coming up. How can we overcome that? We overcome that by being really aggressive at the starts of games, controlling game states, so we can use our players in an, in an efficient way, so we can manage the two competitions. This is new for us. To have the Champions League on top of the league, that's new from last season. Mm. So it's new for the players. There's so many new factors. So it's almost like, don't look at the size of this. Bring it back into something you can manage in your mind and bring it back to something you can manage for the players. And that's how I would uh, approach it because I don't know any other way. When something's that big, is there, any, is there another way? Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, briefly throwing my eye over the... Um over the fixture list and, you know, you think 10 games, can we do enough in 10 games? And then you look at some of the fixtures and obviously Man City away is the one that's looming on the horizon. Yeah. There's also Manchester United away. There's Tottenham away. You, you've got to, you've got to respect those fixtures and the difficulty yeah. of those fixtures. And I think you're right to some extent that if you look at them in all one big go, it's like, oh, fuck that's actually really, really difficult. We're in a great position. We've worked so hard to get here. I think the team deserves to be top of the table right now because, you know, it wasn't, wasn't too long ago, just before Dubai, everybody was writing Arsenal off and saying those two games, two games over the course of Christmas had, had basically fucked the season. And, you know, yeah. it turns out that's not the case because, like, as I said at the time, I think if there is a good time to have a blip in a season, it's then because you've got some time to make up for it. But you've got to be nigh on perfect after that, not for it to come back and, and bite you in the arse. But, you know, it's so interesting. I was thinking like one game at a time. You're thinking chunks of games. Yeah. You're thinking like half a game at a time, a quarter of a game at a time, yeah. uh, and sort of try and, and, and isolate uh, what you can try and control within those parameters. Yeah, I, I, that's why I look at it because if, otherwise it's just too daunting. When I looked at the fixture list, I thought oh, that's that's too much. That's too much. And then you start to look at the players who are not fit at the moment, and you're thinking we're going to need all of you. So whatever happening at Colney right now, I hope they're doing some bleep tests and some running because Fucking we need sure. those players. We really need them back because this is not sustainable with the twelve thirteen we were using since. January, which has been fantastic, been very successful. This block of games has been unbelievable. I only lost one to Porto, but recovered it. The rest has been a dream. And so we have a basis from from which to look forward. But I don't want to, I almost, Andrew, I am not looking at it. I, I refuse to look at the the fact that we could actually win something here. I just want to focus on, on the next thing that we have to do. And a bit of me is a little bit worried because... I'm really enjoying Arsenal at the moment and I have done for a couple of years. It's been amazing, amazing time in my life. Seeing the connectivity within the club and seeing the fans connected to this team, all the players signed up, it's, it looks really rosy. And I'd hate for something to go wrong that we could control that would affect that connection. Yeah, but I, would, I mean, is, is that not about... Look, I know nuance is not really a word that's used too often in, in football coverage, but is it not mm. necessary? Let's say, is it not sort of incumbent on people who talk about the game and write about the game to do so in a way which, I mean, as, as Arsenal fans, you, you've got to be honest, you've got to be critical yeah. when you need to be critical, but struggling to get out what I'm trying to say here, but like, I think the idea that if we don't win the title this season, in some quarters, as we know, it will be reported in a certain way, yeah. in a way that will generate an amount of conflict and maybe feed into some existing narratives and, and everything else. 
Whereas you could look at it as, okay, this is another season where we came close, where we came close, and now next season yeah. is the one where we have to we have to do it again. Like there's a sort of responsibility with how you talk about things and to put things in the right context. Like if we lose ten games in a row, okay. Everyone yeah. get their knives out and their pitchforks out, and that's fair enough. If we miss out on the title by a point because City went on a brilliant run and Liverpool went on a brilliant run, and that's the difference between three teams at the end of 38 games, like, you know, there there is real context needed for that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I suppose with my with my head on, I'm thinking, okay, we go to we go to City and we and we don't win or we lose. I don't think the world's gonna end. Because they're not a bad team, right? They own all the trophies. <laughs> they're not a bad team. But if we beat C, but then lose at home to Luton, then we're open to criticism sure. in a different way. And that's the type of thing. If we do really, really well, and I, I don't I don't want to say these words, Andrew, so I'm not sure I'm going to say them, because if we do really, really well, and we go to Spurs and do something stupid and lose the game, and that costs us, that, that'll be damaging for us. That'd be damaging for our, our connection. So suppose to explain myself better, I'm I'm okay if we don't win, long as we're progressing, long as we're going forward. And I think as a club, we can all agree that we are. Right? So if we if we lose to a better team that has a better run of form and does does something better than us, I can live with it. I really can. Mm. What I don't want is something to happen that maybe we could control against like a Southampton last season. Sure. Bottom of the league, 3-3. Three, three, that shouldn't happen. Regardless of anything else, that shouldn't happen. It can happen, but it definitely shouldn't happen two years on a trot. You see what I mean? Yeah. We must learn our lessons. We must learn from experience. That's why you go for experiences. And so whatever happens, I want it to be something that we've learned from. We're progressing and we're going to find out if we're good enough. And if we're not good enough, we'll find out why. And then we can go and deal with it in the summer. That's what I really want. I don't want something unforeseen that affects our connection and love to the team that we're all experiencing today because I'm really enjoying seeing the unified Arsenal world. I love it. I used to hate the division we were defined by historically in end of the Wenger years. I love what's happening right now and I, I just want to continue as long as possible. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it's a consequence of the stakes being high that... Mm. You know, one misstep might make the difference between fifth and sixth, but the difference between first and second is obviously a lot more painful. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I understand what you're saying. I do think though that that there's so much that's obviously good and going in the in the right direction about this club yeah. that I'm not saying it would be easy to overlook something stupid, but I think to a large extent we saw what was wrong last season and we fixed it. We saw what was wrong with the squad in the last part of last season, and we have fixed it. And look, we're all sitting here going into an inter international break with our fingers crossed that everyone comes back safe and sound without any injuries, and that you get, like you say, guys who've been at London Colney over the last couple of weeks and... Tommy Asu is back and he's fit and he's available. And Thomas Partey is back and he's fit and properly fit and available. And we might get Jurian Timber back and he's fit and available. And you have Gabriel Jesus fit and properly available. And, you know, these players, you can make a, a big, big difference um, who we are going to need during the run in and who the manager is going to have to trust to some extent during the run in, even if I think that's an area that might challenge him a little bit still. Yeah, I think this could be the next podcast over the next few weeks, <laughs> selecting teams. When the teams go well, we'll be happy. When they don't go so well, mm. we'll be saying, well, did we not make a substitution here? Did we not trust this player here? And that's going to be the debate. <clears throat> I'm not sure how he's going to approach it. Is he going to start with a fairly strong team and use the five sub rule to manage minutes? I mean, that, that, that's what I would do, Andrew, if you ask yep. me honestly. Same. I want to control my destiny. I want to control the scoreboard. And that's what I want to do. So I would look at that. Obviously, they have information about where a player is and the injuries and red zone, all the rest of it. So they can make their decisions. But I would focus on a, a on a group. But I would make changes during games regularly. So you, you can take out half the team. So not everyone's doing 90 after 90 after 90. I think that's the way to manage it. 
I manage it in a psychological way. I think some of the things that he said in the past around to be a top player, you've got to play every three, four days. He's been saying it when we weren't playing every three, four days. But now we are playing every three, four days mm. at the critical winning time part of the season. I think he's been preparing his team psychologically, preparing players like Saka psychologically to manage this period. And you're right though, mate. We're watching these England games coming up. It's uh, Belgium and Brazil. And I'll, I'll tell you what, when that team sheet comes out, every person in the Arsenal world will be watching. We're all hoping that Saka doesn't start two games. We're all hoping the Rice didn't start two games. They don't need to, though. That's the thing. I mean, this is the frustrating part about these internationals is they don't need to, uh, but managers live and die by results even at, uh, at international level. So there is that pressure to just pick your best players all the time. Yeah, and Southgate's also got a wonderful relationship with Arsenal, so he doesn't care. He'll just he'll just uh, <laughs> run them out there. And, um, you know, I worry about Martin Odegaard. He's a skipper. He takes responsibility for Norway. And I, I, I've seen when he comes back from those international breaks, it takes him a little while to get back into rhythm. Saliba the same. When he goes away from Arsenal, when he comes back, it takes him a while to get back into rhythm. This is the stuff we have to manage really, really well because the first game back, he's not, he's not looting at home. It's Man City away, right? And everything's got to be tipped up. And that may bring us back quicker, but, you know, it needs to be right because this game is as big as they come. Yeah. While we're talking about the title and I suppose we focused on the squad and the players, but there'll be focus on Mikel Arteta as well and what he can produce in, in this mm. period of the season, a crucial part of the season. I, I think you have to be blind to uh, ignore what a great job he has done and is doing at Arsenal, but ultimately it'll come down to trophies. Do the best managers or the best coaches always find a way to put a trophy on the on the uh, cabinet or in the cabinet or in the whatever you want to call it. Like, <laughs> you know, th think of someone like Diego Simeone. Like there's basically a duopoly in Spain and has been for many years where Real Madrid and Barcelona are by far the wealthiest and by far uh, the best equipped teams. But, you know, in that period... Uh, Simeone has won La Liga a couple of times. He's won the Europa League. He's got to Champions League finals. Uh, even someone like Klopp in Germany, you know, where he won titles with Dortmund, you know, against a, a team like Bayern who win it most seasons. Is it sort of inevitable if Mikel Arteta is going to be considered one of the top coaches that he is going to have to win a Premier League? I think it comes in stages, Andrew. The first thing he has to do is elbow his way into the Klopp, the Klopp Guardiola room, which I think he's done. Mm. You know, I think uh, Guardiola respected him when he was beating us 5 0. He respected the manager. And we all thought it was a little bit of platitudes, but actually he's been proven correct because he's really shown us what he can do. And I think Klopp now respects Arteta. When he went to Anfield this year, you could see there, there was a res different respect level there. So he's got himself into that room, which I think is really good for all of us. So now he has to go past them. Yes, so obviously Klopp's moving on. He has to go past them. And that's going to be very, very hard. For all the hopes that we have, deep down, do we expect him to just power past Pep Guardiola? We hope he can, mm. but do we expect it? I think maybe it's me protecting my emotions, but if Pep was to win... I would say, you know what? I'm not totally happy with that. But he's won six out of seven Premier Leagues. No need to hang yourself over the summer, Clive. Do you know what I mean? Seriously, we go again. There are situations at Man City with the with the charges situation. I can I can I can throw myself into a level of comfort around that, even though it's not right morally. I can I can deal with it. Sure. I I do think Arteta is not somebody that's satisfied not winning. All his actions are about, I am really going for this. And when you look at him, do you see someone on their holly pops? Like, <laughs> I don't see it, mate. Everything he does is so intense. And you've, you've touched on it, Andrew, but I, I want to go a bit better, higher on it. I think he's excellent at learning lessons. I think that's the thing. The number one trick for me is how he recognizes problems, identifies them, and learn from him on the football side of things. 
And so I'm really hopeful that the experience he's had for the last two seasons, remember the top four run? Mm -hmm. And then last year, if he's learned from that, this is the time to show it, to, to make sure that we look better in this period. Whether we win or not, we must look better. We must end the season with better results. I think that's his, that's his measure for me. Yeah, well, hopefully, you know, we finished fifth and improved. We finished second, and we all hope that we can improve again and, and go the distance. It would be uh, an amazing achievement and something for us all to, to enjoy. Speaking of, and very finally, something for us all to enjoy might well be the uh, financial situation at Chelsea. We talked about Everton and Nottingham Forest getting points deductions some suggestions that Chelsea need to sell a hundred million pounds worth of players before the end of June, or they too could be embroiled in, um, uh, what is, what is it? Profit and sustainability PSR, uh, PSR breaches yeah. and, and all that. I thought it was very funny this week when, uh, the Chelsea supporters trust came out and spoke about how the club was turning into something toxic. I, I, I couldn't help Clive, but just think, well, you fucking lay down with the devil for 20 years. Yeah. So much of what is wrong with football these days can be linked right back to Roman Abramovich and his yep. arrival in the Premier League. And look, I I can say it was probably inevitable. If it wasn't Roman Abramovich, it would have been somebody else. If it wasn't Chelsea, it would have been somebody else. But it was Roman Abramovich and it was Chelsea and they enjoyed... 20 years of unparalleled success based on their own history as a, as a football club. You know, they'd won a few things here and there, but a big club simply because they were in London or a well-known club rather simply because they, they were in London. And I, I, I just sort of relish the idea that the chickens might come home to roost a bit. Oh my goodness. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, trying to be magnanimous here and be calm, but they, we've had 20 years of pain from them, haven't we really? Mm. You know, and They've taken the trophies that we should have, we could have had, you know, or got closer to. You know, we wouldn't be talking about a 20-year gap if it wasn't for Roman Abramovich coming in. You know, I'm sure we'd have done something in that time period. And so they, ha he, they have changed the face of the game because other people have tried to mimic them. Yeah, I mean, Abramovich opened the door to the nation states, to what you see at Manchester City, the 115 charges, the Saudi Public Investment Fund as, as owners of Newcastle. And, and like, it, it's only going to go one way once that, once that fucking stable door is open, the horses are bolting. Yeah, exactly. And the, the gap between the Premier League and the EFL is massive now, you know, and it's very difficult to bridge that gap. So this, this trickles down to the derbies. You know, it trickles down to them or their situation. It trickles down because people try to shoot for the dream. Mm. They, and and so it's it has a massive effect to the whole pyramid, you know, particularly in the in the in the championship. And so I've got no sympathy for Chelsea. I'm I'm sorry. I, it is time for the chickens to come home to roost. It is time for us to ask ourselves what we want our game to be. From a financial point of view, what do we want our game to be? Do we just want people to come in? And the guy with the biggest checkbook just wins everything. If, that, if that's what we want. Well, we've got it. <laughs> we, we, and that's what we want. We've got it. Or do we want to look at a team, and I will quote Liverpool and Arsenal here, that are trying to do this organically, failing on a period, failing at times, failing against a bar which has been raised by the Chelsea's and Man City's. Manchester United have failed ma massively. Can you imagine how they're feeling? The team across the road is doing what they're doing right in their backyard. They are building fan parks. Their facilities are better. They've got clubs around the world. I mean, look what they're doing. And they're not sitting there. I mean, for all what you say about Man City, they've got some very smart people behind that club that are mm -hmm. pushing that club forward. They've got the smarts and they've got the brass. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big combination and that we all have to try to compete against. And it's very, very difficult. It's very, very difficult for the monster that's Manchester United. It's going to be very, very difficult for us. So going back to Chelsea, no sympathy for me, Andrew, because they haven't been built organically. They've, they've jumped, they won the lottery, they jumped ahead, they've changed ownership. I, don't, I didn't want to jump on their projects initially because I wanted to understand it. There isn't much to understand. They've blown a billion quid, mate, and they haven't got a centre forward to play with. 
You know, their centre their center midfielders are not in the... They they projected on three younger players. They're not there. They're mm. not there. You know, and um, and so they have a problem. And I'm I'm happy to sit here and just watch that implode. You know, and um, no sympathy, mate, because we were there when Wenger's thousands game when they give us a slap. You mm-hmm. know, and um, there have been many times where we had to sit there. I talked to him about this a lot coming out of Stamford Bridge. Many humbling times. So it'd be really nice to turn the tables on them. Yeah, yeah. Or for indeed the Premier League or financial regulators, whoever it might be to turn the tables on them. And, uh, you know, the the one thing that I would genuinely hope for is that even if there are bargains to be had, Premier League clubs don't give Chelsea their bailout this summer and then we'll see what fucking happens. Exactly. Anyway, we had better leave it there. I've taken up far too much of your time. As ever, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Clive. Thanks very much. Enjoyed that, mate. Take care. Thank you very much indeed to Clive. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Clive PAFC, at Clive PAFC. And of course, you can hear him more regularly over on the Arsenal Vision podcast. More details there at arsenalvisionpodcast.com. Okay, I told you towards the end we would have something exclusive for you. This is what we've got. And I'll explain how it came about. Those of you who are Arsblog members on Patreon will know we do a feature every month called uh, Poorly Drawn Month. Well, it's now Poorly Animated Month. We're making animated videos, but it's basically a recap of what happened in the previous month. I do the words, make up a few gags, Poorly Drawn Arsenal with his magic stylus, brought those things to life and we would post the post and it was there. So, you know, we did that and continue to do that every month. In one of those, about 18 months ago, maybe a bit more. I can't remember the exact details of how this came about, but basically if you've ever seen the video to Club Tropicana by Wham, George Michael is on a a sort of green lilo sunbed type thing floating in a a swimming pool and he's having a great old time sipping cocktails and everything else at Club Tropicana. And the joke revolved around uh, Ben White being George Michael in the Club Tropicana video. So Jacob, poorly drawn arsehole, he drew the image And ahead of our live show at Union Chapel last year, I had a few T-shirts made up because I wanted to wear that T-shirt to the show, which I did, but I had to get a few T-shirts made up. There are only 10 of these in the entire world. There are seven left. I'm going to give away two today. That's how exclusive these are. Now, I've only got medium and large. So if that fits, great. If it doesn't fit, I'm really sorry. I wasn't trying to be exclusionary. I just had to get a number of t-shirts made up. A medium and large were the ones I got. So if medium and large uh, floats your boat, floats your sunbed, if you like, and you'd like one of these t-shirts, simply answer the following question. From which club did Arsenal sign Ben White? Really easy. What club did Arsenal sign Ben White from? Send your answer, please, to competition at arsblog.com. That is competition at arsblog.com. Random number generator will pick a couple of winners. I'll announce them on next week's show, and then I'll get in touch, and you can have one of these exclusive T-shirts that probably not too many people actually want in the first place. I will admit that my fashion sensibilities are, are very much my own. But maybe you're aligned with those. So if you are, enter the competition and you never know, you might win one of these t-shirts. Right, there you go. It just remains for me to say thank you again for being with us. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to become part of our Patreon community, by the way, and get access to these poorly drawn and poorly animated months, because you can get instant access and go back and read them all, and they're very funny, you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash arsblog. Patreon.com forward slash arsblog. It'll set you back six American dollars a month, and you can get on board from wherever you are in the world. Patreon.com forward slash arsblog. Okay, take it easy, folks. Please join myself and James on Monday for an Arscast Extra. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye.
Welcome back to Talk Shite Radio, talking shite about sport 24 hours a day. The big story, Ben White and his refusal to play for England. As ever here at Talk Shite Radio, we are doing things a little bit differently. There is a complete lack of nuance and balance in the reporting about this particular story. Some people are going way, way, way over the top. And we aim to bring the kind of careful consideration you You've come to expect from all of us here at Talk Shite Towers. So, with that in mind, former professional Danny Pills, how should Ben White be put to death? Yeah, well, I think we've got to go back to when men was men. Do it old-fashioned way, like I would go in for a proper hung, drawn and quartered. That's no less than he deserves for turning his back on his country. I suppose the thing is, Danny... You'd have to get near him in order to do that. What are you saying to me? Danny, you are the bloke who nearly got nutmeg to death in the corner flag by Thierry Henry. Remember that? Uh, and you're telling me that you're going to catch Ben White and hang him and draw him and quarter him? I don't think so. I thought we were here to stick the knife into Ben White, not me. Yeah, maybe I've got my own opinion about Ben White playing for England and not playing for England. But even I think you're a terrible cunt. Now, wait a minute. That is enough of that, I'm afraid. Please, somebody escort this man out of the building. We're going to take a commercial break. When we return, is Theo Walcott a Russian spy? Talk show, you bring me. Talking shit about sport 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. 